So I said, what's the difference here? Is it demographic? What is it? The difference was so dramatic that he moved it out to Iowa and he looked at prostatectomies by age 85. He saw a similar shocking degree of variation. And when they studied this six ways to Sunday, they came up with two things that accounted for that degree of variation. Just two things that accounted for it. Any guesses? Some would say insurance. Nope, wasn't insurance. Wasn't a demographic. Number of doctors in the area and where they trained. So if you were trained to treat a presenting set of symptoms with a hysterectomy, even though the science had changed, you got a hysterectomy in that particular region. If there were more doctors doing hysterectomies in that region, more hysterectomies were done, regardless of the need. Now you'd think that that would have been such a, a shot heard around the medical world, that we would have acted on that. In fact, Wenberg tried to get this published, and he started out approaching the healthcare system, and I think the response from the leaders of the healthcare system was, well, that's interesting. Um, Frankly, it's a little annoying. It's an art, buddy. Um, so we don't want to have to explain this kind of variation, but the insurance company sure wanted to know why. Because hysterectomies are more expensive than more conservative treatments. So they began to ask the question, what up with all this? So this is 30 years later, and you'd think that we would have acted on this. This is called the Dartmouth Atlas. You can look in your community, in your state, in your region, and compare yourself all over across the United States by... Uh, number of different types of procedures. Now this one just happens to be breast sparing surgery. So a woman has a lump in her breast and it's cancer and she has the opportunity, she meets the criteria to have her breast saved and just have a lump taken out. Now you can see here by the color, the fine print's not what's important on this slide. It's that color variation. It shows a 30 fold variation. So basically what this says is that if you live in Texas, or rather you live in New England, you get to keep your breast. If you live in Texas, you don't. And what's meant by that is that because this shows 30-fold variation that women in New England, if they meet criteria, largely get lumpectomies, Texas, North Dakota, and other places, they get radical mastectomies. They lose their breasts regardless of whether they meet criteria for more conservative therapy. And this is, now, you look at other sorts of procedures, New England looks bad. So this isn't a New England's good and everybody else is bad. It's just this degree of variation is unconscionable. 30-fold variation? Now, there, there shouldn't be zero variation because if I'm a woman that meets the criteria for lumpectomy and my roommate uh, in, in college died of it and uh, the person in the cubicle over there died of it, I might want my breast gone whether I meet lumpectomy criteria or not. And for me, that's the right decision. But we could not explain 30-fold variation. And my guess is for substance abuse, mental health, addiction treatment, your degrees of variation are just as startling for the kinds of treatments that are used across the country to uniformly treat some of the same types of presenting symptoms. You would see the same degree of variation, maybe more, maybe more. So the cost and quality opportunity when we started looking at it, Fisher Wenberg did some more studies later on that showed that they thought the healthcare system was sporting about 30% unnecessary cost. Now you can see that there are more and more studies here saying everything from 30 to 60% unnecessary cost in the system. Really some mind numbing waste in the system. And when I hear the conversation today about the fact that we don't have enough money to cover everybody, that's baloney. We have enough money in this system. We just waste at an unconscionable rate. And the question is, where's the waste? Can we root it out? We began thinking about this when I began working in Rhode Island, thinking where, what's the source, what, what's, where can we start to get at this waste? And some of it, of course, is that discoordinated, uncoordinated care for patients. We looked at the IOM report that told us that it takes 17 years for something that we learn in science to be propagated through our system so that the people that we serve benefit from it. 17 years in a society as sophisticated as ours? What an embarrassment. That's an embarrassment for us. This is part of why I think we have not only the unconscionable waste, but that inability to communicate, is this is our system. And I began looking at this and thinking about healthcare, ran across an article in The Economist magazine that ranked us second only to mining in terms of lack of investment in information technology. In a place where literally decimal points can mean your life, you can be death by decimal point in the healthcare industry, we're second only to mining? Started thinking about this, and I should never admit this at a healthcare conference, but yeah, I was uh, going through um, Wendy's, <laughs> getting my biggie, and um, <laughs> I'm noticing my order coming up on the screen. And there it is, you know, biggie and large biggie and Coke and all this. And um, I'm thinking to myself, 
there's more technology in getting my biggie at Wendy's than there is in getting my cardiac medication to patients, getting behavioral health medication to patients, to getting treatment information back and forth. I'm getting the benefit of technology here at Wendy's, but um, not when I'm taking care of those people that I've dedicated my life to serving. I started thinking, boy, what's the implication of all this? I, I do think it's a, it's a significant amount of waste. You take that down one level, and we started looking at this is a, a record, a health record of someone in the United States, this is a real record. That's one level down. Go down one level deeper. What's that first word up there? Frequent. Most of you will say frequent, but some of you will say pregnant. Yep. Now, now these are from actual medical records out of Massachusetts. The second one, uh, the test showed, ooh, some of you will say routine, and you won't give it a second thought. The others of you will say positive, and you would be right because that test was positive, not routine, it was positive. And then that third one, heparin, of course, is a dangerous blood thinner, too much of that, and you can have uh, retinal bleeds and so forth. Uh, comes in units, so is that last thing a U or is that a zero? U or zero? Well, the nurse read it as another zero because it looks so much like the other character, she just assumed it was one of those. Well, it's actually a U. The patient got 10 times an overdose in that. Hypo or hypertension? Mm, hard to tell. We see a lot more hypertensive, so we thought that was hypertensive, started the patient on some drugs to lower their already dangerously low blood pressure. And that last one, the test showed negative. Hepatitis. It says hepatitis, and it was missed. Now, this mattered to me, and it's, it began to help me make sense of something. Uh, I nearly took the life of a seven-year-old child when I was a young nurse in Colorado, and um, this shattered me when this incident happened to me. Uh, I was working in a very small hospital, 35 beds, and that's if you counted uh, the gurneys in the operating room, and you know, so we were 35 whole beds. And, uh, but we were all they had in rural Colorado. I loved that job. I was there for seven years. You did the range of work there. You were everything to the patients that you served there. And I loved that job. And one morning I was coming off of a night shift and I was particularly tired. And uh, we had two physicians in our 35-bed hospital, both of whom went home at night and slept. So the 19-year-old licensed practical nurse that was with me and I were just about to get off shift, and I heard the intercom from the surgery unit uh, pop on, and Dr. Lee said, is Laura still here? I worked with Dr. Lee long enough to know that his voice was ominous, that something really catastrophic had happened. So I uh, said, Dr. Lee, I'm still here. What is it? And he said, Laura, I don't know what you gave this seven-year-old. He said, but you need to find out and tell us because, Laura, we can't get her to breathe. We've got her on the ventilator. He said, please find out what you did. And, of course, it was that heart-stopping moment where, you know, you live all your life as a professional in healthcare, hoping that you never do something like that, and I didn't get very far before I did. And so I was frantic, and I grabbed the, the paperwork that I had there and realized that I'd given the child a 10 times overdose of the drug scopolamine. Now, in overdose, scopolamine causes seizures, coma, and death. He was operating on my best friend's child. So I was just frantic. Now, when I got back to thinking about how something like this could happen, fortunately, this child survived my care that night, but just barely. And I thought, how the hell did this happen? Because this is my life's work. I was born to do this work. As a small child, my favorite dolly, she was one that was rubber and stuffed with cotton. The reason she was my favorite is because she could take injections, I swear to God. And um, my mom's a nurse, and so she would come home, and I knew not to touch the dirty syringes, but anything clean and in the package was mine. Once in a while, I think she did it for my benefit. She'd bring home a clean TB syringe in the pocket. I'd grab it. You know, any loose tape, any other supplies that I had. I made off with her bandage scissors once, but I got caught and had to return those. But everything else she let me have, including a little vial of sterile water, which I was just thrilled to have because I'd amassed all these supplies, and wouldn't you know it, my baby became deathly ill.